Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to The Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's episode of The Dairy Edge, I'm joined by Keith Davies, farm manager of a 1,000 cow estate in the UK. Keith was over for the Once A Day Milking Conference to talk about the success behind their Once A Day system and I first asked him about the background to the farm. It's owned by a, a chap called Lord Bledislaw. Um, it's an estate that uh, back in 2001 was a 350 cow pedigree Holstein dairy herd fully housed uh, with an arable farm on it as well growing uh, rape, barley, maize, uh, wheat and grass in rotation and also had sheep and beef. And, in, and when did you start working on the farm? I, st- I came there in 2002, uh, 2002 uh, to manage the dairy unit. So at that point there was 350 cows all indoors? All indoors, milk three times a day. And talk through kind of the diet of the cows, the production of the cows. Uh, the diet of the cows then was maize, grass, silage, um, huge amounts of concentrates and they were yielding around 10,500 litres a cow. And I, I guess you've, you've taken a journey to where you are today. So today, how many cows are you milking? Uh, we're milking about 1,000 cows. Okay. I say about because we, we calve around 1,000 cows and then the numbers drop on and off as the year goes through as we lose one, ones or twos here and there. So, Can you talk us through and give us some insight into the decisions around increasing cow numbers on the farm firstly and also uh, you know, the shift from milking three times a day to once a day? Um, the process was we got through to uh, up to 2006. The farm is, is, although it's owned by Lord Bredis, though it's on his estate, it's actually treated as though it's a tenant. So therefore we have to pay quite a high rent. And and we, w- we could just about pay the rent, but we weren't making much of a profit. And Lord Bledisloe decided that he wanted to look at other, other systems as to whether he, his dairy farm could be more profitable. And that's when we dropped on grazing-based systems. Um, when we moved on to that, we very quickly realised that we could make a, a lot more money in dairy farming than we could actually have any, other, have any of the other enterprises that we had on the estate. The sheep, the beef, the barley, all the, all the rest. So then we made the decision that we were going to take the cow numbers up. Well, when we got to um, 700, around, it's about the 700 cows in the, on the farm, the r- big restriction then became the milking parlour that we had. The milking parlour was only a 32-point rotary parlour, and milking, milking 700 cows twice a day through a 32-point rotary parlour was just taking too long. So it was at that point we, we had to make the decision either to put a new milking parlour in or or stop with the cow numbers that we've already got, or find another way. And, uh, and it was at that point we actually uh, went to see a, a few once-a-day dairy farms in the UK and thought, well, actually, we could make that work. And it was still profitable enough to be more profitable than any other enterprise that we would be replacing. So that was where the process took us. And then in terms of the, I suppose, the increase from 350 to 1,000, I mean, there's a huge draw on labour, an increase in the the people required for for that process you know t- how did the labor evolve uh well it did just basically evolve so actually as cow numbers rose we ended up taking on more staff or and and it just got bigger but we because we were milking three times a day initially um we we did have quite a reasonable number because we had a separate team that just did the night milkings so therefore, we had a, for a dairy farm of 350 cows, we had probably had a, a, a bigger than average labour labour uh, base. And but it's as it's gone up, we've had to take on more and more staff. And but we've had to be to get these people. We've had to be fairly flexible because uh, getting um, labour onto farms full stop in the UK seems to be quite difficult nowadays. Uh, so we've moved on to being very flexible. We quite happy to take people on part time. Uh, we're very happy to take people on that have never have no experience at all in in farming and you know I think we can echo it here in Ireland there is a huge um, I suppose labor shortage within the dairy sector and as you say people need to be flexible so you you talk about you're taking people on that have no experience so how are you finding that and what are you doing in particular to train these people we're more it's all about attitude rather than their experience we're 
So the interview process is a bit, uh, a little bit different in the way that we actually try and find out the character of the person. Uh, we profile them and so as we know what type of character they are. And also we take them to see livestock. And what I want them to do is when the cow, because the cows and or calves are always inquisitive. And I just want them to be interested in the cows and calves. And if one comes and pushes them or nudges, they pat them on the head and because they show empathy towards the animals. And that's, if they've got empathy towards the animals, I find they're a lot easier to work with. And because they've got an interest in doing a damn good job with the, with the cattle. And that makes the big difference. So we've taken on people that actually don't really, they've got all the intelligence and they've got all the intention to be good with cattle, but they're not when you come to actually putting them down, on, putting them on farm. So I'm very flexible in the type of person I take. And say, I know you can't put an exact timeline on it, but from people you have taken um, in, in terms of labour on the farm that have no or limited experience, how long do you think it takes to train them that they're fully competent with, say, the milking um, operations or, you know, looking after livestock? It varies on the person, but uh, we've got taken on uh, two lads um, that were actually straight out of school, so they were 18. Um, we took those on two years ago, and now we're very happy. To, they, we'd be very happy with them. They do quite a lot of milking. One's uh, second in command on the on the young stock unit, so um, so we and so he he's in total charge of those when the when the main guy for the young stock is on holiday or it's weekends off. So you know that that's two years we've taken them to get to there that we're perfectly happy with them. But some people would be quicker and some people are slower. Um, yeah, to totally variable. And then looking at, say, an annual cycle now for your farm, um, you're, you're calving in spring. So talk through, say, I suppose, start of, of calving and, and, and calving length. Um, well, calving length is a, is a well, we, we serve for 12 weeks, so it's meant to be a 12 week calving block. But then actually, our start date is 21st of Feb, but so we've got actually calves dropping on the ground from sort of the 10th of Feb, um, which is particularly, you know, we will have calved over 500 animals before the end of February, so uh, which is a pretty particularly hectic time. So we'd have a lot of members of staff, and we've got, we'd have a, we've got a, one chap who will just be in on nights, all he does is. So for the f until 21 days into calving, we've got somebody on farm 24 hours a day with calvings, just making sure that's done. And we've got uh, the, the, full, the six full-time members of staff will be on their usual rota, but no holidays are allowed in that. They'll get their weekends off or their day, ro rostered days off, but there's no holidays allowed. Mm -hmm. And we'll also be using all uh, most of the part-timers that we've got, and they'll have been rostered in. It's, it's interesting you say that you start calving around the 20th of February. So in Ireland, we, we aim for roughly the 1st of February. Is there something in terms of land type or decisions that, that makes you pick a, a later date like that? Uh, yeah, the later date was because we used to calve, we used to start calving the 7th of Feb, but we found uh, our magic day or balance day or whatever we care to call it is about the 2nd or 3rd, of, usually about the 2nd or 3rd of April. Well, we were running out of grass. So by the time we got through to around about the 20th of March, we actually were feeding, the diet was three quarters silage, one quarter grass, because we were running out of grass. So, uh, so just by shifting it though, that 13, 14 days um, has made the difference in that we don't run out of grass and the diet just keeps on, more. they just get more and more grass. So that was the reason for calving later. We were just running out of grass. And then, say we set a target of, we aim to have cows milking for 305 days. Are you looking at something similar? Um, I, I don't actually count the number of days we're looking for them to milk, but we because we dry everything off just before Christmas. Okay. So that actually, the, 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 the cows that calve last in our 12-week block, if you, they're actually pretty inefficient. So we're probably looking at shortening our calving block down to a 10-week block. This this time, yeah. So so I I mean those cows that would calve later, say they'd be at they'd be at a two hundred and sixty day lactation, which is is very similar to what we'll do here because, by and large, spring calving herds that like to be dry for Christmas, everything is dried maybe Christmas week, you know that the, the whatever is left milking. So so again, uh, fairly similar, and. You know, then talk through performance of the herd. Like, if you could give us some metrics in terms of milk production and fertility. Uh, milk production, we we sell uh, around about three hundred and seventy-five kilos of solids a cow. Um, 
we think that we could we should be able to get to 400 but because we've been always in expansion for reason in recent years uh, we're carrying quite a high percentage of heifers in the herd uh, so that that holds us back because heifers obviously don't give anywhere near what a mature cow would give our empty rates run between sort of eight and nine percent um, which which could be better but you know we're fairly happy with that and I guess if you'd have come from the the Holsteins that we used to have, we'd be very happy with that. And just on the three hundred and seventy five kilograms of milk solids, you know, you've mentioned it's an immature herd, so that you know, as you reach full maturity, you know, you should easily achieve the four hundred kilograms of milk solids. But if you compare yourself with other farms in the UK, what sort of solids are they achieving within the grass based system? Uh, within the grass based season system, the Twice a day farms would probably be doing the 450, uh, maybe 500, but uh, we, we'll be a fair bit back from that. But um, it's not all about production, it's all about cost of production and we're, we're pretty tight on that really. And, and, and you mentioned that when you talk about cost of production, you're paying rent. So you, you obviously have to pay for yourselves within the whole farm system and farm estate. You know, is that typical within these larger units uh, most larger units would actually be uh, probably owned. They wouldn't be t- uh, they wouldn't be tenanted, so they would they would have the benefit of not having to pay a rent. So therefore, they could probably spend a bit more money on their infrastructure. But we're uh, we're paying a very high rent back to the to the uh, the the land owner, well Lord Bledisloe, and um, so that restricts on the investment we can make within the. And I guess, look, there, there, because you have that focus, there, there is a strong focus on, on ye making profit, you know, on, on an annual basis. Say, we find maybe one in five years can be a challenge in Ireland. For example, if we look back to 2018, there was a, you know, a severe drought. And, 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 and during the spring of that year, there was also very poor weather conditions. And I suppose that was a people broke even or made a small bit of profit in that year. Is there a challenge like that in the UK where you find that there's a, a year where you're just about breaking even? Yes, well, that last year would have been the same. We had, a, we had a severe drought with us as well, 2018. We, um, we make all our, well, the example is we make all our silages for winter feed. Uh, we make those in May, June and early July. Well, we'd filled our silage clamps by the end of June and we'd empty them again by the end of August because we had to feed all our food back to the to the milking cows that we were meant to be feeding to the dry cows. So that was a year of great challenge, but actually we still came out and made, we paid the rent and, and, a, and we had a little bit left over. But uh, that would have been, yeah, so, and, but as I said, it, we pay a, a particularly high rent. So we're, we're very happy with the system and, and, it re- and actually in some ways that reassured uh, Lord Bledisloe that uh, he was running the right system because in the past his, that, the previous system would not have been able to stand that. And, and, and so you mentioned you've, you've pretty good costs, you've a good handle on your costs. Um, we, we look at costs in Ireland, we have the profit monitor and that's what we look at and we, we refer to it in cents per litre or a kilo, uh, euro per kilogram in terms of costs. Um, when, before we include labour uh, and rent, we have a cost of production in around 24 cents a litre. Um, could you give us a guide in terms of the cost of production on average in the UK? The cost of production on average in the UK for all dairy farms is around about 30 pence a litre. Okay, and is that all costs included? That's all costs included, yeah. yes, that's including labour. So uh, that possibly coming in quite similar to us because looking at particular farms, like we have a greenfield farm in Ireland um, that was in production until the middle of 2019 and when they take in full costs including labour, rent, repayments they were looking at somewhere in around 35 cent a litre so probably very comparable with with your own production systems. In terms of the decision to go once a day we've discussed that Um, do you ever consider a situation on your farm where you will revert back to twice a day and, and maybe chase that 450 kilograms of milk solids that the average twice a day farmer is doing? Oh, sometimes we have dark thoughts like that, um, but uh, not really, um, because you, you would actually magnify the issue of, of labour. Labour is, you know, I sort of bel- don't belitt- belittle labour, but I sort of make it isn't that much of a problem because we're flexible. But if you went to twice a day, we'd need even more people to milk the cows. And, 
and then they're always asking for housing or us. Um, we don't we don't usually give out housing on the estate, but we sort of give them their their money would allow uh, to for them to rent a reasonably local property. Property is becoming more and more expensive. It's the biggest issue would be the labour would be what deters us from doing it really, and also moving a thousand cows in two herds around twice a day become the 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 logistics become quite difficult as well and and finally then keith if if we consider you know we're here today at the once a day conference and there i mean there's people engaging with once a day in the country but we also have people here today who are are milking twice a day but considering once a day as a real option for them themselves have you any tips for them you know going forward any anything that they should really think about you know if they're going to transition from twice to once a day milking do it as a business not um that's why we've done it we did it simply as a business is have a genuine business decision to make it because some people do it for a lifestyle and i don't think i think it might work as a lifestyle but you're not going to make much money out of it because you tend to take your eye off the ball i might be wrong but the once a day farmers that i've seen do it in the uk on lifestyle seem to have taken their eye off the ball whereas we've con- concentrated but uh, it's not it i don't think it may it, on the highs it won't make as much money as if you were twice a day, but you'll become a more stable business. That's great. It was lovely to get insight from, from somebody across the water that's that, um, engaging in some interesting technologies that we can learn from. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. And that's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Keith Davies for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey, and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.